You're listening to Nightlight. Hello, Chris Glynn here with the latest Nightlight podcast. Thanks for joining us. I have a new guest to introduce to you on today's program, Brother George, who has his own excellent podcast, and I've invited him to join us on today's show. Welcome to Nightlight, George. Where are you speaking to us from? Thanks for having me on, Chris, and I'm glad that uh, my uh, podcast is inspiring for you. I'm speaking to you from outside Melbourne in Australia. We have a guest tonight on Nightlight. And the topic I've asked George to teach on is an age-old question. Why does God allow so much evil and suffering in the world? Good question. I know that this can be a, a very highly emotional topic, Chris, and it goes really deep for a lot of people. As a matter of fact, the other day I was speaking with an elderly lady who I hadn't seen for a while who's suffering a mountain of serious health and family issues at the moment. She knows I'm a Christian and I've ministered to her in the past and she was sobbing as she explained everything that was going on in her life and she kept asking me, why has all this happened? I've tried to be good all my life and now all this happens to me. Why? Yes. Well, you know, tough experiences of life as well as the effects of moral evils like war, genocide, uh, we've got poverty, oppression, violence. And then there's natural evils such as disasters, disease and death, especially of loved ones, children and the young. These things, they cut deep and they're extremely painful experiences. Right. And I I don't blame anyone for wondering where God is in all of that or why a loving God would allow such things to occur. And it's one of the main reasons unbelievers give for non-belief, also one of the main reasons believers lose faith. Yes. It happens a lot. Something bad happens and they go, oh, well, you know, God's mean or God can't exist because he allowed that to happen. That's right. So it's important that we answer the question. It's very important. The comfort in the midst of the pain and the healing, that the healing balm that takes away the hurt, is that there is an explanation found in the Bible. An explanation that answers the question you just posed and it helps us to make sense of evil and softens the blow of having to experience it. Okay, well, let's first of all start with the question, where did evil come from and is it God's fault? Did he create it? Yeah, good question to start with. Uh, And the answer is no, it's not his fault and he didn't create it. Actually, after God created the heavens and the earth, including the first two humans, Genesis 131 tells us, and God saw everything that he had made and behold, it was very good. There was nothing corrupt or evil about it whatsoever. The Garden of Eden was a paradise. And Adam and Eve and their descendants could have lived forever in that perfect state, uncorrupted by evil. But unfortunately, among all the created beings were also angels. And one of them was named Lucifer. Right. Otherwise known as Satan or the devil. If you read scripture passages like uh, Isaiah chapter 14, Ezekiel chapter 28, and Revelation 12 verses 3 and 4, these passages tell us that Lucifer was a very high-ranking, stunningly beautiful and powerful angel who unfortunately wasn't satisfied with his position. And he and the other angels, like humans, had free will. But rather than be content with his blessed position in the heavenly kingdom, Lucifer wanted more. He wanted to be God. Yes. But that obviously wasn't possible. So by his own free will, he chose to rebel against God and even persuaded one third of the other angels to join the rebellion. And so they were, well, they were all expelled from heaven. And so what happened from there is that Lucifer and his demons then embarked on a jealousy-driven, ruthless campaign of trying to corrupt and destroy God's beautiful creation and turn humanity against God in an attempt to gain humanity's allegiance to himself. Right. And one of their major destructive activities is to entice humans to disobey God. Now, most people know the story of how he tempted Adam and Eve to disobey, and that's told in Genesis chapter 3. You'll find another example in the book of Job chapters 1 and 2, You know that story very well, Chris, I'm sure. Yeah, right. In that story, the devil actively attempts to turn a wealthy landowner named Job against God. 
So the devil and his demons also began to wreak havoc, not just amongst humankind, but also in the natural realm, as evidenced by the introduction of sickness, death, uh, natural disasters, floods, and all of that. And none of these evils, George, were present in God's original creation, right? Exactly. That's right, Chris. They originated not from God, but from the devil and his demon followers. And they were able to introduce the effects of evil into this world because Adam and Eve allowed them to. Yes. By their own free will, Adam and Eve ignored God's warnings and disobeyed. And unfortunately, we continue to allow evil forces to influence us. And so evil continues to affect us to this day. So it's not God's fault. That's important to establish from the beginning. It's not what he intended at all. In fact, it actually breaks his heart to see what's become of his creation. And never more so than now, as we see the flood of evil that's absolutely engulfing the world today. Uh, Absolutely, certainly. Shining bright through the dark night, you're listening to Nightlight. Now, I know some people will scoff at this explanation of the origins of evil, that it's all the devil's fault and Adam and Eve's fault and all of that. They could react like, oh, what do you expect us to believe that fanciful story? To that, I can only say, well, why not? Now, power struggles, sedition, treason, and rebellion against authorities has been going on in the human realm for millenniums. Why not in the heavenly realm? That's right. If you discount this Bible or the biblical explanation as fanciful, then you have to consider what you've got left, right? And what you will have left is that the evil and everything else in the universe is just a product of random natural forces that happen to come into existence. I think that's an even more fanciful story myself. And worst of all, it offers no guarantee of an eventual end to evil like the Bible does. That's true. Think of it. If you go down the route of rejection of the biblical explanation, then you have to resign yourself to perpetual evil, ongoing, and that evil is just a state of nature and that there's nothing you can do about it. So if you happen to be the poor person to which evil befalls, well, you you are just unlucky. There's no recourse for you, nowhere to turn to. I wouldn't want to go there, and unfortunately a lot of people do, right? Okay, George, so we've established that God didn't create evil, so, so why did he allow Satan to rebel and Adam and Eve to disobey? What was his reason for that? Well, a major answer has to be to allow for free will. Now, of course, the downside of creating everyone with free will is that we can choose to do evil, and a lot of people have chosen to do horrendously evil acts. But that's just the way things have to be, because the alternative is not acceptable, at least not for now. Of course, the results of free will have been devastating and painful in many cases. That's a fact, true. Well, George, some people ask, doesn't God care about these things? If he's all-powerful, then why doesn't he just put a stop to it all? Right. Well, your questions really follow on very natural to what the average person will ask, subsequent to the last question. Why doesn't he put a stop to it? Does he care? Well, he does care tremendously about this. And in fact, if you really read the Bible, you'll find that in his mercy, he has put in place a variety of measures to limit evil within certain parameters to ensure it doesn't get too out of hand. And on occasion has actually almost like broken his own rules to intervene to put a stop to it. In fact, the story of Job shows us that God put certain restrictions on Satan's influence and activities. So he he limits evil so that we don't all get completely out of hand and we all become mass murderers and uh, nature doesn't go completely haywire and we're having earthquakes and floods every day, right? The devil's trying to utterly destroy humankind and nature, but God has put kind of a, a partial force field around this world so that things don't go out of hand. That's one thing, right? Right. Another thing is God has created us all with a conscience, which is his voice in the heart of every human, whether they're a Christian or not. That's true. Now, because of that, we inherently know that, for instance, that other people have value and that it's wrong to kill, hurt, or mistreat them. And our consciences also tell us we should help those who are suffering. And we also inherently know that we should behave in ways that benefit ourselves and our communities. Yes. Yet, in spite of... Adam and Eve and all humans subsequently being created with a conscience within 1,500 years of the creation, 
and Adam and Eve's disobedience, humanity had spiraled into such a depraved state that God felt he had no choice but to wipe the slate clean with the flood. Now, I'd like to get you to read Genesis chapter 6, verses 5, 6, and 11, if you don't mind, which describes the situation at the time. Chris, can you read it? The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord regretted that he'd made man on the earth, and it grieved him to his heart. The earth was corrupt in God's sight, and the earth was filled with violence. Right. So God saw that that generation of humans had become a hopeless case. And that if he allowed the situation to continue, humanity would be in a perpetual state of depravity and violence. It grieved him so much, his heart was so heartbroken, that he put a full stop to this ongoing evil generational cycle by ending the earthly lives of almost every human being and sending them on to the next life where they could learn their lessons there. And as everyone knows, only Noah and his family survived. So God gave them and succeeding generations a second chance. God was active in putting a stop to the evil. It's not like he just sat back and and let it happen, right? That's right. So right at this point, he kind of broke his own rules in a way. But did that eliminate the cancer of evil thoughts and violence? (laughs) Unfortunately, no. Humanity went straight back to all manner of despicable behaviors such as, and these are all outlined in the Old Testament, uh, worshipping false gods, uh, ritualistic human sacrifice, including child sacrifice, and even cannibalism in some places, uh, genocide, violence, sexual assault, and all manner of sexual perversions, including sex with animals, forced slavery and human trafficking, oppression of the poor, uh, I could go on. And all happening in the world today. So the flood quote-unquote, didn't work, didn't stop evil, right? So God went to his next step to combat moral evil. He called out Abraham and instructed him to form a completely new society, which became the nation of Israel, which was a nation that was commanded to be separate from the surrounding nations. And through the prophet Moses, God gave them a very strict moral code and firm instructions to avoid the evil behaviors of the other nations. And he promised them that if they obeyed, they would be more protected against natural evil. Now, Israel was designed to be a shining light, a shining example of a people living in obedience to God, righteousness, equality, peace, and security. This was God's next step to fight back against the evil. Right, and we know that God's plan for Israel didn't work out so well. (laughs) Yes, Exactly. Overall, that was, that was uh, what happened. It, it was a beautiful success at times, but an utter failure at others. And they reverted back to the forbidden practices of the surrounding nations. And so God took his next step. He sent messenger after messenger to plead with Israel to get back on track. They did. But largely, they refused to listen, and they even killed some of the messengers. Meanwhile, the surrounding nations kept up their wicked behaviors. This went on for centuries. We're going back here to does God root care, right? Um, and I'm outlining all the, all the ways he showed that he d- does care. This is where it gets to he shows us his ultimate care. Right. He ended up coming here himself in the form of Jesus to get personally involved, to show us how to live. And he gave us his ultimate commandment that if obeyed would radically minimize evil behavior. That is his law of love. And on the cross, he even joined us in our suffering so that he could sympathize with us. And of course, he offered salvation and eternal relief from all evil. He promised that one day he would return to the earth to finally defeat the forces of evil forever, to punish the devil and other evildoers, and to bring about eternal good. Praise God. So, George, one reason God cannot have for allowing evil to continue is that he doesn't care. He does care very much. That's exactly right, Chris. As I outlined all those steps that he's taken to mitigate the effects of evil, he cares immensely and he's gone to extreme lengths to do something about it without interfering with our free will. That's just the one thing he won't do. 
Right, so God does have the power to be the ultimate totalitarian dictator if he wanted to. He could have created us as pre-programmed robots designed to mechanically obey him without any conscious decision-making power or autonomy of our own. He could have done that if he wanted to. Yes, he could have. He has that power, actually, but That would be weird, don't you think? I don't think anyone wants that. No, absolutely not. He could have chosen to allow free will, but continually threaten us with severe punishment for misdeeds and forced us to be good out of fear. But he did neither of those. Instead, what he did was he willingly gave up the authority he could have had over our decision making to allow us the freedom to commit the ultimate injustice, that is, to spurn the one to whom we owe our very existence. That's true. What this does is that this ensures that our relationships with him and other people are based on genuine love. Yes. In fact, Chris, love for God or others just cannot be real genuine love if there isn't also a choice to dislike or even to hate. That makes love more special because you can choose to hate God, right, or anyone else, but you, you love them even if you don't understand why they're doing things or whatever right so that's one way to look at it nightlight. you're listening to an international edition of nightlight shining god's love light to the world so george what are some of the other reasons why a god of love would allow so much sin and evil and suffering in our world right well besides uh, free will it's been said that you never appreciate good health until you've been sick. I can testify to this, and we'll get to that later, but uh, isn't this true of not just health, but any of the blessings we have in life? We don't appreciate them until we lose them, at least temporarily. So if humanity had always lived in a perfect paradisiacal world, like the Garden of Eden, without evil, the question is, would we have been able to truly appreciate it? Without any evil to compare with, how would we even have known how good we had it or how good God was to us. That's right. So while evil and suffering are not good experiences to endure, they they do serve a purpose of reminding us of how good we usually have it. And one day for the believers, when we arrive in heaven, we'll truly appreciate God and the perfection of the heavenly paradise by comparison to the hell on earth. That's a day to look forward to for sure. Actually, here's an anecdote I read once many, many years ago, and I, I never forgot it that illustrates this point. A group of visitors at a summer resort had watched the sunset from the gallery of the hotel. One man lingered until the last glow faded, and he seemed thrilled through and through by the beauty of it all. One guest, more observant than the rest, wondered about this, and so at supper she said to this man who sat next to her, You certainly did enjoy that sunset, Mr. So-and-so. Are you an artist? No, madam, I'm a plumber, he responded with a slow grin. But I was blind for five years. Hmm. Beautiful story. Yeah, very beautiful. So, Chris, experiencing evil and suffering can have a purifying effect on us. And it teaches us valuable lessons that can enrich our lives and bring us great joy. Imagine this blind man's joy at seeing the sunset. There's a scripture, actually, I'd like to add to this uh, here. Can you read James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4, please, Chris? It says... Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work, so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. Wow. You know, that is a a bombshell, the first four words of that. Consider it pure joy. You can have pure joy in the midst of your experiences of uh, evil and suffering. Why? Because he brings out some benefits here, produces perseverance. He says you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. So besides perseverance and maturity, here's a few other lessons we can learn that can bring this joy that it speaks of in the verse there. Suffering can make you either bitter or better. And God's hope is that we're better. Suffering purges us and shapes our character in ways that make us better persons. Suffering also causes us to empathize and sympathize with others. It draws people together in solidarity and unity of heart. 
as an example, 9-11 in New York, that type of disaster, what happens after all of those things? People come together, there's hugging, there's mutual support, there's um, volunteer work that reaches out to people in need and there's beautiful stories come out of those things, right? Right. And suffering makes you grow in wisdom and knowledge as well. So a person who has suffered and come out better can actually become a greater, more well-rounded, happier and contented person. Yes. Do you know the famous Italian singer Enrico Caruso? Yeah, I've heard of him. I can't remember listening to him. Yeah, well, I listen to him because my mom's Italian, you know, and uh, she she used to play his records back in the day, you know. Uh, he, he was from, I think, the 40s or something, you know. But uh, he put it this way, and he was world famous. He said, to be great, it is necessary to suffer. Shining Love's Light. You're listening to Nightlight. George, another good reason for evil and suffering is that they can cause unbelievers to seek God or strengthen the relationship that believers already have with God. Like it says in Psalm 119, 67, Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Yes, we do tend to forget about God when the going is good. But then when things get tough, many of us turn to God. And as, as you said, some people turned against God. That's a choice that has to be made, right? But it is human nature. Actually, one Bible teacher wrote that Adam and Eve were closer to God after they were expelled from the Garden of Eden than when they were in it. That's an interesting thought. Why? Why were they closer? The reason is because the hardships they began to endure when they were you know, basically kicked out of the Garden made them appreciate God more and cause them to turn to him in spirit for help. So the existence of evil and suffering are a way for humanity as a whole to learn these valuable lessons we've been talking about. Right. You could liken humanity to a bunch of rebellious teenagers. A parent of teenagers or a, or a high school teacher knows this, what they're like, right? Right. In the days of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, we were innocent and pure, like sweet little children, right? And then the children grew up to teenhood, as it were, and started making our own choices, the wrong ones. And our parents, the, the Holy Trinity, didn't like the choices we began to make, but they refused to force us to obey. And we wouldn't listen anyway, like some teenagers, right? So they had to let us go our own way for a while in order that we could learn our lessons the hard way right but they trust that eventually we'll learn and that there's going to be a happy restoration of the parent-child relationship in the end that's true so one reason god could have for allowing evil is to let humanity learn our lessons by our own mistakes chris i came across a sports themed motivational quote once and this is what it said victory isn't just walking across the goal line it's struggling through opposition to the goal. So, of course, life can be tough. But if we face our struggles and faith with courage, we can come out victoriously. And the feeling of victory will be much more euphoric than if we just had an easy ride through life. George, I think this would be a good place for you to share your own experience with suffering because the lessons you're sharing with us on the show today come also from your own personal experiences. Oh, okay, yes. I have, uh, as you know, uh, suffered a bit. Before I say anything, I I'm not gonna about to say that I've suffered more than other people. Th there's been plenty of people who've had far worse things happen to them. But what has happened to me has happened to me, and it's been hard. Uh, when I was 37, at a time when my life was going great, I suffered kidney failure. So suddenly I needed blood cleaning by a, what's called a dialysis machine, this blood cleaning is done in a clinic. It has to be done in order to stay alive, without which I would be dead within a week. It's a continual cycle of four-hour sessions three times per week. So this happened when I was 37, which is very, very young to happen. Gosh. I remember the first dialysis session and how discouraging it was that I was the only patient in the clinic in their 30s. And there was another 30 or so patients who were all over 60, and most of them were in their 70s and 80s. 
but uh, I had been unfortunate enough to suffer a rare case of kidney failure at such an, a young age. And my wife and I had five young children at the time as well. It was quite a shock. Dialysis is, it keeps you alive and you can function, I would say, at about 50% of what a normal person can function. And if you're doing really well, you can do, go 20 years on dialysis. Now, some people last less than one year, others go longer, but it, it was a huge struggle. And I didn't know how long I would be able to live or what would happen to my family if I didn't make it. So it was a highly emotional and uh, stressful time. I'm sure. Well, what happened was I did two and a half years on dialysis and then miracles happened. I got a miracle kidney donated to me by my beautiful sister. God bless her. I wouldn't be here today without her sacrifice. And so my health improved and it all seemed to be on the upswing. Uh, my family was very extremely relieved because they, they were worried that I was going to die. And uh, all things were going really well until just a few months later, after the transplant, my wife, who was 34 at the time, suddenly passed away from a brain hemorrhage. It came totally out of the blue, no forewarning. Gosh. It just seemed such a senseless thing to happen to my children and I. We were devastated. To make a long story short, that was a rough period of life for me. It took a few years to recover. That was all 20 years ago. The kids grew up. Thankfully, they're doing really well. Oh, good. And the Lord started to bring the sunshine out again. I remarried, uh, which was amazing. I didn't think that would happen. And I have two young children with my wife now. So that's a, a wonderful blessing. Yes. But the next twist in the story was uh, more problems. Uh, uh, about five years ago, my transplanted kidney failed. So I had it for 16 years, which was great. And now I'm back doing dialysis again three times a week to stay alive. God bless you. And I'm a lot older now. I'm 61. So I have a whole, I've developed a whole bunch of resultant health problems. And I don't know how many years I can last. So it has been a struggle. Yes. And I'm telling you the very short version of the story. But it's been a long ordeal with my personal fight with evil and suffering. With a lot of twists and turns, I must say, when evil and suffering hit me personally between the eyes, I had to learn how to deal with it. I had to learn not only how to cope, but to also somehow turn it to my advantage. Here's a real jewel of advice from the Bible that helped me a lot, actually. Romans 12, 21, which says, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. That's what it says, overcome evil with good. So it is possible to face evil and to not only bear it, but to actually overcome it. You can flip the script and you can turn it into something positive. So, George, from your own experience, how do we do this? Right. Okay, well, this is coming from my experience. I would say there are two stages of turning bouts with evil and suffering into good. The first, if it really hits you suddenly... You just have to initially cope with the situation. You have to determine not to allow it to ruin your life. You've got to make a determined effort to hang in there until the storm passes and the, the sun comes out again. Now, it's natural to just have to, to struggle for a while. That's all about all you can do. And here are a few other points that I've got to help people, uh, I've got that can help people get through. One, don't blame God or shove him out of the picture. Rather, put your trust in him realize that God does care and we've covered that right and that he's in control of the situation and that he has a plan and a purpose for it even if you can't see that plan or purpose now you can also find comfort in knowing that Jesus suffered immensely and unjustly like you maybe and that he sympathizes with you Two, put yourself and your situation in perspective yes unless you're an extremely rare case there's usually plenty of other people in the world that are in just as bad or worse circumstances than you. And they're handling their issues. So if they can, you can too, right? That's true. I know I'm not the only dialysis patient in the world. I mean, uh, I was doing dialysis in Japan and I knew there was another 200,000 people there doing it. So <laughs> Gosh, that many. And some of them were w worse than me, you know. So that helps. Three, lean on strong 
trusted people that you can confide in. Good point. Look, everyone needs a shoulder to cry on sometimes. And we just have to admit that the situation is just too painful or hard to bear. And we need to vent a little or shed some tears. And that's okay. Yes. It's especially good if someone can pray for you or with you. And you, you'll feel so much better for it. But when you're sharing your troubles with a trusted friend, one thing is to be careful not to get too much into it because it doesn't help to continually be moan and complain about your situation, either within yourself or with others. So besides the time when you're venting your feelings on a trusted loved one or a friend, it's best to try to maintain a positive attitude. Yes. Try to keep a smile on your face, even if inside you're hurting. I know this is easy to say, Chris. It's very easy. It's just words. But it's a monumental struggle. I understand that. But this is true. If you do these things, then it can, it can help. Finally, number four, well, when push comes to shove, you just got to soldier on. Amen. No matter how hard a situation is, sometimes you just got to slog it out until things improve or it gets better for you to, or easier for you to handle if it's something that's ongoing. If you can pass through that first stage of just getting through the initial blow of your situation, then you can move on to the stage of turning the evil into good and even using it as a springboard for great things. Yes. Here's a verse that's very helpful to remember. Romans 8, 28. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. That's a beautiful verse. It's really the go-to verse for uh, flipping the script on evil and suffering. God is promising that it can work together for good. So you've got to actively look for the good that can come out of your situation, the positive, the benefits, because God's promised that there will be the good coming out. Yes. You can ask questions of yourself like, well, what have you learned that can make you a better person? How has the situation improved your character? How can you use it to your advantage? Now, in my case, I learned a lot from my struggles, and, and I'm still learning. I learned to have more compassion and sympathy for others. And this has helped me to be a more effective witness of the gospel. My struggles have humbled me. They've rubbed off some of the um, rough edges of my character and helped improve my relationships with others. They've helped me draw closer to God and strengthen my relationship with Him. And I've learned a lot of deep lessons and have been able to pass those on to others personally and through my podcast as well. Praise God. Actually, Chris, about a year and a half ago, I was virtually bedridden for a few months. And I was feeling quite discouraged that I couldn't be active in missionary and volunteer work and, you know, Bible studies and all the things I used to do, like performing charity concerts, feeding the homeless. I mean, I used to be very active. Sounds like it. I couldn't do that anymore. And I was, I was bedridden and room bound. And it was a really tough time for me. But God spoke to me and he said, well, you can't do those things, but you can speak. So why don't you start a podcast? So I did. And my podcast and website were born and are being listened to and viewed by people around the world. So that's something uh, good that came out of that hard time I went through. Like a candle in the night, it's nightlight. Also, uh, you can find encouragement and inspiration from many examples of well-known people who turned their suffering to their advantage or who didn't let their suffering get in the way of doing great things. Back to the biblical example of Job, the wealthy Old Testament landowner who lost his vast fortune, his flocks, he lost his home, his children, and finally his own health through a series of terrible natural and personal disasters. Yet, and it took him a while to get to this point, but he did keep his faith in God in the end. And by the end of his ordeal, he was doubly blessed with twice as much of all those things that he lost. There's also the... Uh, world-famous Christian writer and speaker and uh, disability advocate, Johnny Erickson Tada. Have you heard of her, Chris? No, I haven't, but uh, yeah, tell us about her. She's a well-known American. At 17 years old, she became quadriplegic after a diving accident. Gosh. So, so that's all four limbs, completely immovable. So after her accident, she went through a very understandable period of anger, depression, suicidal thoughts, and doubts about her faith as you would expect. Right. But believe it or not, she now sees her tragedy as a blessing. She's written more than 40 books. She's a Christian, a speaker, and a traveler, a traveler all around the world. 
an artist and a singer. And uh, she also has a, a daily radio podcast. And the articles she writes appear in well, countless magazines. Uh, she also has a charity foundation called Johnny and Friends that brings the gospel and practical help to people affected by disability around the world. God bless her. I invite you and your listeners to look her up. Her name is Johnny Erickson Tada. She's an amazing example to all of us of turning suffering into good. Imagine that, quadriplegic since she was 17. God bless her. People like her don't let the devil or evil and suffering knock the life out That's of them. right. What they do is they use the evil as a motivator and a springboard to do great things. You know, getting personally hit with evil and suffering in a big way is one of the biggest challenges in life. But as the Bible says, these things can work together for our good if we trust in God and actively seek to turn that situation around to our advantage. Amen. So I want to say to your listeners, Chris, if you're discouraged at the state of the world, if you're disheartened by some seemingly senseless tragedy or if you're suffering something that seems to be unbearable yourself take heart these things are not just bad luck or the result of random forces working against you or others there is a god and it's not that he doesn't care about it or that he's being more mean to you he cares more than you will ever know he has a plan and he has a purpose for it all and he intends to turn those seeming defeats into victories that will enrich your life and make you better in some way. If you just can't see the good in it or why he allowed those things to happen now, just wait. Because just because you can't see anything good in it now, it doesn't mean you never will. Remember, we're the teenagers and he's the adult with the higher perspective. That might mean waiting until the next life. But God surely will reveal those things to you at some point because he does care and he loves you. And in the meantime, while you're experiencing suffering, you can remember that Jesus, who suffered immensely and understands, he promised to be by your side in your suffering. You can let that encourage you and motivate you also to share that comfort with others who need it. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he speaks of this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, 3 and, uh, verses 3 and 4, where he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort of with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Inspiring you to draw closer to God. You're listening to Nightlight. Nightlight. George, thanks so much for all you've shared. Before we close, please tell our listeners where they can find your weekly podcast. Yes, it's called Bible Made Easy Podcast, and uh, you can find it on any app or uh, internet-based streaming service, uh, such as Apple, Google, Spotify, Audible, Amazon, Podbean. <laughs> Just type in Bible Made Easy Podcast into the internet, and you should have no trouble finding it. Or type it into your app streaming service, and you should be able to find it, no problem. So that's Bible Made Easy Podcast. Thanks so much, George, and we'd love to have you back on the show again very soon. Well, thanks. Uh, I'd be honored to join you again, Chris. And I hope that today, in this particular episode, I've been able to give some comfort and peace of mind and answers to your listeners concerning the existence of evil and suffering. Thank God for the insight and answers he gives us in his word, the Bible, which is where we get the faith strength and courage we need to face whatever he throws at us and to get through it bravely and victoriously. Amen. And thanks, George. God bless you. God bless you too, Chris. It's been great to be on with you. And you'll find a link to George's website and his podcast on Podbean, where you'll find 10-minute podcasts on a wide variety of topics. This is Chris Glynn signing out and looking forward to being back with you again soon for another Nightlight podcast. Bye for now.